preaching. <laughs> hey, if you will, go ahead and turn with me to Luke, the gospel according to Luke, the second chapter, the gospel according to Luke, the second chapter. We have been in our series in Luke now, I think this is our ninth or tenth week, um, trying to take this verse by verse to fully understand the context of everything. So this week we dive into a uh, very simple and easy passage to understand, nothing difficult at all. I'll kind of explain it after I read it and stuff, what we're going to do with it today. But it uh, should, be, um, should be good because it's God's Word. If you're there, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20, this is the inspired Word of God, and this is what he says. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel, there was with an angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angel went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Upon the reading of God's word this morning, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for another Sunday, God, another Lord's Day to be able to gather in your name, God. God, this morning I just ask, God, that you would speak through me. God, that you would just make this lesson, God, your scripture known to us, God, in just a very powerful way, God, but in a way in which we can understand it, God, a way in which we can continue, God, to give you all the honor, the glory that you are due, Lord. God, thank you for everyone that is here this morning. Lord, um, I just pray as it's been a um, somewhat of a busy week, God, just take distractions away from us. God, help us to be able to concentrate on your holy word this morning, God, on the things that you are doing, on the things that you have done, God, on how good you are, God, as Brittany said, on how sovereign you are. God, help uh, once again, just take any hindrances, God, anything away from us that would uh, hinder us from allowing to worship you to our fullest this morning. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... This morning, I'm going to break this down into two different sections, but it's going to be a bit different. I'm only going to explain one section. That's verses 8 through 14. So that's verses 8 through 14. The rest of it, verses 15 through 20, I'm actually not going to talk about, but I will read it one more time. The reason why is verses 15 through 20 are just very self-explanatory. So if I do a decent job of explaining verses 8 through 14, you'll fully get the overall um, theme and the picture of the remainder of verses to come, and um, we'll look at that and stuff. So I'll try to paint that as clear as I can as we go through today. Now, where we've been so far, if you haven't been with us or if you uh, forget like I do all the time, I know that I'm in this, um, this book every single uh, week, especially in the gospel according to Luke, but I still even forget things that I've taught at the beginning of uh, Luke and um, even things that we were in James and stuff. It's, it's hard at times to remember everything, but let me rehash it. Where we've been so far is there's been Zachariah and Mary received basically um, a, a, a telling tale from this angel, basically saying you're going to have children, you're going to have a child. 
And Zechariah, of course, with Elizabeth has John the Baptist, as we know. Mary gives birth to Jesus. Now, in order for Mary and Joseph to be able to travel to Bethlehem, which was already rearranged, it was already predestined, if you will, it was already foretold a long time ago in the prophets that in Micah 5, 2, this one that is coming forth, this one from ancient of days, will come into Bethlehem and he will be born. So what does God do? Well, here's Caesar Augustus flexing his power, saying, I'm going to have a registration, a census. And what that was is, is basically a taxation on the nation of Israel and to also gain military might and power for the Romans. They want to know how many Israelites there were. They want to know how their army was doing as far as how many people were in the Roman army. And they wanted to tax the Israelites pretty heavy, not just the Israelites, but all the known world that the Romans had conquered at that time. So what happens? Here's Caesar Augustus flexing his power, but what is God doing? God, through his sovereignty, is drawing um, Mary and Joseph into Bethlehem because that's what the prophet said would happen. So here they go into Bethlehem, and throughout this census, they give birth, Mary gives birth to baby Jesus. Now, where we're at also with this story is, and I think Dakota did a beautifully, uh, well, amazing job last week, really orchestrating and talking about the kingdom of God. Because what we usually think is, okay, well, Jesus was just established, and the reason he's established is to what? Well, to take the beating, to die on the cross, to rise from the dead, to ascend into heaven where he's at the right side of the Father, and we just leave it at that. But the overarching theme of the gospel is not all about just that, even though that's glorious. That's amazing. That's what our faith hinges on. It's also whenever the Messiah arrived on the scene, he established a kingdom that was prophesied about. And this kingdom continues to grow, and I'll talk more about this kingdom. And Dakota really hammered that last week, that there's many people that believe the kingdom of God is coming. Many people believe that the kingdom of God will never come. Many people believe that the kingdom of God just has already all the way came and things just went chaotic and they don't know what to think about it. But the thing is, when people say, Kyle, how do you know that the kingdom of God is actually here today? It's quite simple. Jesus, in the midst of these people, are doing these things and he says this. The people are saying, it's from the power of Satan, right? It's from Beelzebul. But what does he say in turn from that? He says, are the things that I do are from the finger, the power of God, then the kingdom of God has come here now upon you. He says it's established. The root is laid at the tree. The old kingdom, the old establishment in Israel has fallen down. And what does he say about the mustard seed? I'm planting it. Here it is. It's going to continue to grow. It's going to be a mega kingdom, an amazing kingdom, completely in his providence and by his sovereignty. So now looking at verses 8 and 9, starting out, now that we kind of have a background a little bit, knowing where we've come from so far in this story, Jesus is born. He's born at this time. He has not been circumcised yet at this time on the eighth day. We'll get to that next week. But now we start talking about these people that are called shepherds. Now, this is the most famous thing, right, around Christmas time. The shepherds come. Now, what most people don't understand about shepherds are they were the most despised group of people 2,000 years ago in the nation of Israel. People hated them. Now, it was so bad, in fact, that they were not even allowed to testify in the court of law. So just think about this real quick. Say that I'm a shepherd, okay? And I, I am in a sense. I don't say that jokingly. I am a sense. But say I'm a shepherd that's actually tending the sheep in uh, modern-day Israel, modern-day Palestine 2,000 years ago. Now, say a crime happens, and the shepherds are the eyewitnesses. The judges in those days said, they're not trustworthy. We can't buy their eyewitness account. You've got to have somebody else. That's what they looked and viewed when it came to the shepherd. They were despised. They were the low lives. People, people called them liars, thieves, the unintelligent, the lazy, like, guys, this was a simple job. Here are the shepherds making sure that these people, I mean, these uh, sheep, um, these goats, anything that they were actually shepherding over and protecting were well protected, were well taken care of, were well fed. 
But at the same time, we even have jobs today that some of you understand and know about that we don't even elevate the people that are in these jobs as any type of value. We don't even look at them as valuable. We don't look at them as actually giving any type of input towards the job or being responsible with anything. There's people that have certain areas within their job that we just say, well, they're just at the low end of the totem pole. We just look at them as lazy, as the unintelligent. That's just where they're at. And guys, I think the best example I can tell you today is when I was thinking about this this week, when I deployed in Afghanistan in 2011, you had your grunts, your infantry unit, that would go out and they would patrol every day. Okay, so that was their main job. That was my main task as a machine gunner. Patrol, patrol, patrol. But then there's these other Marines that have to stay back and they have to guard on post. So you'd have these patrol bases that we would actually patrol out of, and you had three different points on my patrol base of Marines that set up in these towers. And what was their job to do? They were the eye in the sky. They were the protection over the other Marines. At night when we're sleeping, if they're not on post, what happens to the battalion? What happens to the company? Well, we're probably going to perish. We're probably going to get in some gunfights people don't want to get in because we're caught off by surprise. But what's so funny is, even in the Marine Corps, when it comes to these people that set up on post, infantrymen just like myself, it's funny that we would joke around with them as being the lazy people, of being the people that weren't really valuable to the deployment. Even though, if we don't have them on post, we're not even able to do our job. And the same thing happened to basically these shepherds. You had to have the shepherds watching over the sheep for many different reasons, some that we'll talk about in just a little bit. But it was actually a job that was um, at one time back in, back in Israel hundreds to thousands of years ago um, before the arrival of Jesus that people looked at that job and actually thought it was pretty valuable. People like David and so forth were actually shepherds at one time. So people had taken it, they had twisted it, and they had distorted it. Now the Pharisees could not stand them because what they did was, if you remember the Pharisees, they took God's law. 600 plus commands of God's law. And they would take an area of God's law and they would say, this is what God says, but this is what we say. And we're going to tack onto that law. Now, this is quite dumb. Now, just think about it. Has there ever been anyone besides Jesus to actually live out the law perfectly? No. Jesus was the only one to do it. So are any of these Pharisees actually able to live out the law? just the 613 commands that they're given, are they actually able to live that out perfectly? We would all say no. But what's so foolishness, foolish about it is they would actually tack on additional laws on top of those 600 plus laws. And the thing is, the shepherds couldn't keep them. They couldn't do it. So the Pharisees would look at these shepherds and they would say, we've put this stuff into practice that you need to obey because we say, and you can't do it. Therefore, they were even hated by the religious elite in those days. Now, here's something I want to talk about very, very briefly. And you need to know that it's an exciting thing. It's always been exciting. It always will be exciting. But what do you notice all throughout the gospel, the Old Testament, and all throughout the New Testament, Paul's epistles, what Peter writes, what James writes, what John writes, what Jude writes? You notice a common theme. And here's the common theme. God doesn't always pick the people that we would pick. He picks the unpopular. He picks the ones that are the outcast of society to actually come to follow him. That's what he does. And you notice all the time in Paul's writing that Paul will say things like, God has no favorites. So what I love about this is the shepherds are going to be among the first to see the birth of the Messiah. Jesus is born, and they're going to go and visit him. Now just think, everybody is waiting for the arrival of the Messiah. And who gets to go see the Messiah first? Is it the Pharisees? The Sadducees? The religious elite? The common Jews? The high class of the day? No. It is the ones that are despised by society, being the shepherds, that are going to go get to visit the Messiah first. 
That's what I love about the gospel. Jesus is so counterculture in a variety of different ways. What you also have to love is this. I don't think many people actually think about it. Here are the shepherds. They're the first ones to visit the Messiah at his birth. Who are the first ones to visit Jesus primarily to see that Jesus had rose from the dead that were despised also by the culture when it came to being not trustworthy? Women. Women. Women and shepherds were counted as not trustworthy in Jesus' day to not be able to testify in court. Shepherds go and see Jesus at his birth, the first ones at the grave to be able to tell, weeping right. What I love about it so much is basically Jesus as a garden, gardener at that very time. Everything started in the garden, and here's Jesus as a gardener, and she's basically looking, saying what? Um, why are you bothering me? Where have you put him? Where is he? And so basically that whole story unfolds. We'll get to that um, in a, definitely another week and def- definitely another month. But overall, God has no favorites. That's what's so amazing about the gospel message is he takes the outcast. And I tell you, that is a lesson that many of us need to learn today. Those that are despised by society, I ask you and I tell you guys, and God commands you to befriend them to take them in, to get to know them. It is not always about what's just popular. It's not always about the people that dress right, that look like, that have the financial capabilities, that are multimillionaires, that own franchises and businesses. It's not all about those people. Those people need the gospel as well. But at the same time, the gospel advances to everybody. And we need to remember that when it comes to all people. So now the, the next thing I want to cover When it comes to this, very briefly, I don't mean to get off topic, but this is a question that I was asked um, twice following um, our section two weeks ago. Many people ask about when Jesus was actually born, okay? Now, I'm going to give you two different opinions on this, and either one you can go, go with. But guys, we have no idea when Jesus was actually born. The day, the month, we're not told. I don't even think that we're really told in oral or any type of traditional um, history or any type of account like that. Now, of course, we worship Jesus on December 25th, all year round, of course. But I'm saying our Christmas season, when we celebrate his birth, is December 25th, the the season leading up to it and a little bit after it is basically our primary time as Americans and people across the world. But what many people say is that it couldn't have been in the month of December. Now, the reason they say that is this. During that time, the highlight for shepherds and sheep to be out at night were from April April to September, that they would actually graze, they would go out and they would climb the hill country and the shepherds would watch out over them. So they say it was during the warmer months. Now that's one way that you can view it and look at it. So some people say it was September. Some people I've heard have even said it was July. We really don't know. Here's the other take on it and the take that I actually buy. Now whether it was December 25th or not, I have no idea and I wouldn't want to lead you guys astray in telling you that for a fact. But we need to remember this. I don't think it's accurate to say that sheep would only um, travel, especially at night, and would not travel during the wintertime. The reason why is, just think about sheep real quick. If you shear a sheep in the United States, if you take the fleece off of that, the coat off of that sheep, on average in the United States, they have an average of 7.2 pounds of coating of um, fleece once they are sheared. 7.2 7.2 pounds. Now that's on the lighter side. There are some countries when after you shear a sheep have over 20 pounds of fleece. So now think about it. That on average in America, 7.2 pounds of fleece makes five to seven large wool sweaters. So are sheep okay in the winter? They're fine. Okay. The other thing about this is this. Most people don't know in Israel during the winter months at night, at night, the average night temperature in the winter is only 43 degrees. So guys, we can handle 43 degrees. Of course, the shepherds could handle 43 degrees. They had wool tunics and coats that they wore during that time. The sheep are completely fine. But that's just to kind of give you two different angles. When people say it had to be from April to September, even to this day, the shepherds also roam year-round. 
Okay, so we don't want to just limit it to one time. But if you buy the other one, that's completely fine as well. Either way, Jesus was born, right? All right, he's ruling and reigning. Good. The last thing I want to mention when it comes to sheep, many scholars and theologians believe that these sheep being only six miles from the temple. Remember, this is in the region of Bethlehem and Jerusalem. So at max, at max, they're approximately six miles from the temple. They would have most likely been the sheep that would have been used for temple sacrifice. So it would have been a big job, basically, for the shepherds to walk with these sheep to make sure that they're well protected from what we learned two weeks ago. They had lions, they had bear, they had wild boar that were around many different parts of Israel. So right here, what they're going to do is they're going to protect them because there were thousands, thousands of animal sacrifices that happened every year at the temple. So it would have been a, a big thing to place a hand on these sheep to make sure that they're well protected. Okay? So, these shepherds are tending the sheep, and this angel appears to them. Now, we've already heard the angel that has came twice before in chapter 1. That's the angel by the name of Gabriel. So, Gabriel talks to Zechariah, and Gabriel talks to Mary. Right here, we're not given the name of this angel. We're not told exactly who this angel is. Either way, the angel comes... And the glory of the Lord is shown around these shepherds. And what do you think happens? It's the same thing that happens throughout the entirety of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, they are terrified. They're in fear. There's almost this panicky attitude about them. Some scholars say if you study the Hebrew and the Greek long enough, you will actually come to find out when it says fear, it is talking about a soreness in fear. That means the intensity over the entire body would have possibly made you even sore for the remainder of your days. It was that intense on the people. So I want to talk about something as we're covering not a lengthy passage and what we're going to be going over today. I want to dive into some other areas that I think are very important, very uh, easy to understand, but lessons that we need to hear. The first one is this, guys. Within the evangelical circles today, I know many of you see this. Maybe you have been like this. Maybe you've experienced this. It seems like within the church today, what happens is there's not really a fear of God. There's not a fear of the presence of God. There's not a fear of the things of God. There's not a fear of the glory of God. And so what's ended up happening is we have many different things that go on in our culture when it comes to YouTube videos, when it comes to social media outlets, when it comes to books, when it comes to even commentaries, when it comes to conferences, when it comes to worship events, that people don't have a proper reverence and fear of God. So these ideas just kind of run wild. And you guys know what I'm talking about because you see it plastered everywhere. You see pastors saying, I saw God. I experienced the fullness of Jesus. I heard a pastor not long ago, he said he was doing a morning prayer at his church, I believe he said. And he said, all of a sudden, Jesus is appearing right in front of him. And he's just having this casual conversation like everything's good. But that's what the church has adopted is that you and God are buddy-buddy. That you're just tight. You're just best friends and everything is good with your relationship and you just sit down and you have a beer together and you drink coffee together and you go out to eat together and Jesus tells you his problems and you tell Jesus about, you tell Jesus about your problems. Like that's the stuff that we hear around the circle today, isn't it? And it's plastered everywhere. The problem is you're not going to find that anywhere in God's word, not one place. Not one place are you going to find that. It's because God is always feared. So I want to go over a few different things this morning, talking about that here is this angel that appears to these shepherds. Unknown. They had no idea that this was coming, and all of a sudden you know that they're just kind of shrieking in fear, just absolutely panicking. The glory of God, it says, is shining, is shown around these shepherds. The first thing we need to discuss this morning is this. No one, no one, except for Jesus Christ, except for Jesus Christ and, of course, the Holy Spirit, has ever, has ever seen the fullness 
and the completeness and the glory of God. Nobody else has. I know many times people end up sitting there saying, I have. I heard one person say in a YouTube video one time and even in a comment section that they said one time God actually did reveal himself in his fullness. And through everything that he had told him and stuff, that he was doing this for a specific reason to get a message out to the nations. So he actually granted him, granted that to him. The problem with that is, of course, this. uh, God doesn't contradict his word. And if he's already established something to Moses, he's not going to come back into our time frame with people that are very hostile to God, that don't even know theology, and all suddenly reveal himself. So this is what is said in Exodus 33, 18 through 20. Moses says, please, God, show me your glory. Moses said, I want to see all of it. Please, can I, just, can I just see it? Here's what he says to him. I will make all of my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said this, you cannot see my face. He's talking about his full glory here. You cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. So what does he do to Moses? He puts him up on this rock. He puts this cleft around him. And as God passes by, he immediately releases that and he lets him see a portion of his backside. And it's almost unbearable to Moses. God says, you can't see me and live. God is that mighty. God is that powerful. He is that holy. Thirdly, God has revealed himself in history through forms and physical ways in which we can actually see him. This is called a theophany. And always throughout the Bible, great fear would always come over the people that saw a theophany. I want to read you Isaiah and what Ezekiel says. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 4 through 5, I find this so fascinating. Because we're not talking about anyone like Kyle. We're not talking about just someone that's a pastor of a church. We're not talking about your average Christian. We're talking about Isaiah. Isaiah the prophet. This is what happens. He's in this vision And it says, And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. So he's seeing this theophany, this presence, this glory of God, not in God's fullness. And it says this, And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now here's Isaiah, this godly man, this man that wrote this very, very long book, this letter in the Bible. He's not your average dude, per se. And what's so amazing about this is to notice exactly what happens when God's glory comes upon Isaiah in this vision. What does he immediately start doing? He starts admitting his sin. Now, what always happens in the Gospels? Woe to the scribes and to the Pharisees. Isaiah says, woe to me. Woe to me. He goes, I'm a man of unclean lips, and the people that are around me have unclean lips. He's noticing right before God's glory exactly who he is before a holy and infinite and mighty God. He is nothing. He is nothing. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 28. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And listen what happens to Ezekiel. And when Ezekiel saw it, he says, I fell on my face. And I heard the voice of one that was speaking. Now that's like it. Like that's what we should see on the YouTube videos, right? When anyone proclaims that. And when we talk to our pastors and all these people that go to the, these uh, apostolic churches and stuff, like I'm, God's surrounding me. Here he is. I'm seeing the presence of God. He's everywhere. And what ends up happening is people are just standing upright, dancing, saying they're seeing Jesus, 
And you have two men that are saying, I immediately started confessing my sin and I fell on my face. There was always fear. There was always a reverence and respect to God because he's the holy. So the lesson behind this church is this. We need to have a proper fear and reverence of God and we need to be careful of those who do not. Who do not. Let's look at verses 10 through 14. We see for the third time in Luke that an angel says, once again, fear not or do not be afraid. So immediately they would fall in fear. And I love how every angel comforts them. He would always comfort them and say, fear not. It's okay. It's okay. Everything's going to work out. Don't worry about it. But what this angel says is something that is so interesting and fascinating to me. He starts telling him that the one that they are basically going back to see, what he is bringing is good news. Now, what is that talking about? Well, the definition of the gospel is good news. I love that. Because the good news encompasses so many different things when it comes to the story of Jesus and when it comes to his entire plan of salvation and what he is going to do in history. And that's exactly what the angel says, that he has brought good news to these shepherds. Now I want you to think from another standpoint, how much good news do you think these shepherds get a lot? I want you to imagine the emotion for just a minute. Now put yourself in this arena, put yourself in this actual um, scenario, in this event. You're the one that is despised. People hate you, people call you unworthy, people call you all these different names throughout your life. You're doing your job trying to support your family, you're doing your job trying to protect these sheep. No one likes you, you're the outcast of society. And what does this angel say? I'm bringing you guys good news. Now, I don't know what their face was like. I don't know exactly what happened. The text doesn't tell us, but I could imagine they probably perked up pretty quick. Wouldn't you imagine? Pretty, pretty quick. Now, I want you to notice verse 11. This is everything that this text this morning hinges on. Verse 11, as this angel is speaking to these men, to these shepherds, this angel uses three different titles to talk about the one that they are going to go and visit. Now, who's just been born? Baby Jesus. Okay? Here's this child, this infant, in this manger with his mother, Mary, with his adopted earthly father, Joseph. And so here's where he's at in Bethlehem, residing with his parents, being well taken care of somewhat. It was a bizarre scenario. And so the first thing that this angel says to them is that he is the Savior. He's the Savior. Now, this is only placed two different times in the gospel as far as um, I'm able to, I was able to study this week and find. It is placed right here that Jesus is called Savior in the gospel, and it is placed in John chapter 4, verse 42. It says this, They said to the woman, this is the woman at the well, this is the Samaritan woman, and if you remember the story here that Jesus goes up to this woman speaking to her and she's talking about the Messiah and he's basically like, uh, it's me, I'm right before you. And so he starts telling her all the men that she's been with. And so what does she do? She goes running off to her own town and telling everyone, this man that claims to be the Messiah is telling me about things and he doesn't even know me. He's telling me all that I have done. And we don't know how the full account was arranged, but she does say in the text, whenever she's speaking to the people, that he has told me everything that I have ever done. Probably not exactly literally everything, but Jesus is making it well known to her exactly who he is. So this is what happens. They're in the town, and these people come up to this woman, and they say, it is no longer because of you but what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So he's called Savior right here in John chapter 4, and this angel, this angel, given to these shepherds, brought down from heaven, calls the Messiah 
the Savior. Now, what is he going to save us from? We discussed this also two or three weeks ago. He is sending his Son. The Father is sending the Son through the work of the Holy Spirit to save us from God, from the wrath of God. He is saving us from our sin. He is rescuing us. He is saving us and rescuing us from the punishment of the sin that we deserve to bear. Jesus is coming to take all of that away. It's amazing to me in 21st modern day America and even within the church how little that gospel actually goes out. It's the most exciting thing. It's like what else people always sit there and say, well, you know, there's only so many things that we should say about the gospel and about certain things when it comes to salvation and stuff throughout the year. It needs to be something that is preached daily. It's the message of messages. It is absolutely fantastic that we have a God that comes off of his throne sent as the son to die and perish for the penalty that every single one of us should pay. The son is saving us from the father's wrath. Praise God for that. And if you remember all the way back in chapter 1, at the very beginning of chapter 1, we talked even about the name of Jesus, Yeshua. His name actually back in, if we were to do the Hebrew side of it, is Joshua. What does that name mean? It means Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh, Jesus, Yeshua, he's the Savior. He is coming to rescue his people. The next thing that the angel says is that he is the Christ. He is the Christ. In Greek, the Christos. Sorry, guys, I just turned the wrong page. He is the Christos. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. Now, when we say the anointed one, we need to remember back in the Old Testament, who were the ones that were the anointed ones? Do you remember? You had the prophets, you had at times the high priest, and you had the kings. Now, what is he telling us right here about the Messiah? He's the Christ. He's the anointed one. There is one that is coming, and he's saying he is established today. He has brought his kingdom. And who is he? Well, he's not a high priest that's going to eventually be taken off the throne. He's here to stay. He's not like the prophet that we're going to get away, we're going to do away with because he's sinful, because something's wrong with him. He's not a false prophet. No, he's the prophet of prophets. And he's also the king. That's why we refer to Jesus as the king of kings and lord of lords. Because that's who he is. And that's what the angel is telling us today about him and was telling these shepherds about him. He's all three of these different things. He is the Messiah that Israel was waiting for. And they knew at any moment he was arriving on the scene. And here are these shepherds being the first ones to get to go to visit him. The third thing that he is called is he is Lord. Now let's discuss this one for a minute. This is the most convicting one. This is the one where pastors are not liked. This is the one where Sunday school leaders are not liked. Elders and deacons are not liked. Family members are not liked when they speak about Jesus being Lord. That's who he is. Now, guys, when we talk about Jesus being Lord, what is he Lord over? Because there's two different categories people go out on. If you know at this church, we talk about this often, is there such thing as neutrality within this? Like, can Jesus be Lord over here, and it's your life over here, and you can just sit in the middle and pick which one you want to choose? No. If you go the path of society and the world, what God actually says is, you're now in hostility to him. You're against him. He says, you're either for me or you are against me. There's no gray area in that at all. So when we talk about Jesus being Lord, this one is so, so important that we understand in the life of Christians and that the church continues to get this message out, even though it's hard sometime for us to actually bank on, to even understand at times, and for us to actually buy it and do it and obey it. But when we say that Jesus is Lord, we are saying as a church, standing on the holy word of God, that Jesus is Lord in every single area of life. What about creation? Is he Lord there? 
Yeah. He's Lord there. What about whenever we talk about just us as people in our everyday lives? Is he Lord in just like three hours of the day or in everything that we do? Everything. Here's one no one likes. Is Jesus Lord over your weekend? What about the Lord's Day that we're on today? Is he Lord over that? What about when it comes to eschatology and the study of theology and many different things that we study in the Bible? Like, do we get to escape and claim neutrality when it comes to that? Or is Jesus even Lord over our study? He's Lord over everything. He's Lord over your marriage. He's Lord over your life. He is Lord over your sexuality. He is Lord over all. You know why we don't like that? It's because we try to be in charge at times, and we think that we can divide the Christian life from the worldly life. We think that we can have these individual life of doing things that we want to do on certain times during the week, and then we can plug back into the life of Jesus whenever it's convenient. Let me just go ahead and tell you this. If you're going to be a faithful follower of Christ, every single one of us need to know this. If you are going to be faithful when it comes to being a Christian, you are going to be uncomfortable the majority of your life. Very uncomfortable. If you don't believe me, come and join me with some stuff. I'll put that challenge out to you. And I'm not even like John the Baptist. I'm not even like Paul, and I'm sure to heck not like Jesus. I'm just a sinner saved by grace trying to do the best I can. But let me tell you, every single time that we ever disciple somebody or we walk with somebody or they say, Kyle, let me see some of the things that you were doing, I let them know right off the bat it is extremely uncomfortable. Because your family will come against you, your friends, people within your congregation. There are a variety of different settings that people will ride against what you believe. We need to be patient. We need to be gentle with those people. We need to be gentle even with culture at times. But at the same time, you will be pressed into an area that is not comfortable. And you will have to stay and live in that area as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. But here's the glory of it. It's the most rewarding life imaginable. It's extremely rewarding. The reason that we don't get pressed outside of our comfort zone is because Jesus is not Lord in every single area of our life. Now, what I always do for you guys, because I don't ever want to be the prick that stands up on stage like Pharisees, so who do I always pick on at this church? I pick on me. This was, once again, as I always say, one of the most convicting things for me this week was just this. Very convicting. Because there's a lot of things that Jesus is Lord over in my life, and there's a lot of things that he is not. And I'll just go ahead and tell you this morning, just to be transparent with you, to be honest with you, as a pastor, as a fellow Christian, a fellow brother in Christ, this morning, I will not even take communion in the Lord's Supper because there's area of my life that I have not repented of that Jesus is not Lord over. That has caused much worry and much devastation in my life. It's when we get right with him and we make him Lord that things eventually end up growing with our relationship with him. Until we do that and we confess our sin to him and we actually repent. That means when you're walking a direction, we face the other way and we walk the way that Christ has commanded us to walk. Obedience to his law, obedience to his word, Genesis to Revelation. When we do that, that's when the church takes off. The problem with us as people, as sinners is, we don't give Jesus every area of our life. We hold back finances. We hold back time. We even hold back things when it comes to our children and our spouse. And Jesus calls for every single bit of us. Is that convicting to me? You better believe it. It's embarrassing for me to have to tell you guys that at times. But I'm more concerned about being a faithful follower of Jesus than to care what the hoot of anyone thinks about me. He's got to be Lord in every single area. And if he's not, you will see damage and you will see chaos come into that different area of life. Mark my words. And if you don't mark my words, you can believe it from the text of the Bible because he makes it blatantly clear in his text. He's got to be Jesus. He's got to be Lord. He's got to be God in your life in all areas. I hope that we can do that this morning. So the angel tells the shepherds, When you are to go into the city of David, you're going to find a child, an infant, that is wrapped in swaddling cloths 
and is lying in a manger. Now, we talked about the cloth uh, two weeks ago, the swaddling cloths, and what that looked like. I'm going to say it one more time. So whenever you had a baby, you would wrap each individual leg, and then you would wrap each individual arm, and then you would wrap the entire child. It was a way of protecting the child. It was a way of uh, keeping the child warm, especially in winter months. And it was also a way to make sure that the limbs remained straight and there was no deformity that eventually was caused um, from not doing this. So that's the first thing he says, is look for this child in swaddling cloths. Now, this was a thing that had been done for a very, very long time, even back in Ezekiel's day. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 4 through 5 says this, And as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No eye pitied you to do any of these things to you out of the compassion for you. But you were cast out on the open field, for you you were abhorred on the day that you were born. So what does he say right there? He mentions a child. He's actually talking about the nation of Israel, but he mentions swaddling cloths. So this tells us this was something that was done years and years before even the birth of Jesus. You would not believe how many people write commentaries and different articles saying that Jesus was the first one to be dressed like this. He wasn't. This was a very common traditional thing. So now some of you are sitting there thinking, if these guys go throughout Bethlehem, There's probably many baby boys that are in swaddling cloths. How are we going to find this one? What's the next thing that the angel says? You're going to find this baby not only in swaddling cloths, but lying in a manger. That was not normal. That was not the common traditional setting and thing that you would do in that day to be just lying in some type of animal's trough. And so what I often like to think about, and I have no scriptural evidence, so don't hold me to it or anything, but what I, I like fast, it kind of just was fascinating to me this week was since Jesus is even, uh, either in a stable or outside or in some type of cave, how amazing would it have been as they are traveling to hear the cry of Jesus that maybe possibly brought them in because of his location of being in a manger. We don't know how they were actually brought to there, but it's fun to think about. So they're going to note and mention a child in swaddling cloths and laying in a trough is how we are going to find this child. And, of course, they do. Now, lastly, the text tells us that there was a multitude of heavenly angels that end up showing up in the midst of the shepherds and of this other angel. And we don't know the amount of angels that there were, and I think many people speculate this, and they try to figure out how many angels are there actually. Now, the text doesn't tell us about this scenario, but just in general, it's a question that many people ask. How many angels are there? We don't really know. But I can give us, we can kind of come to some clues and some different um, things in the text. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 11, this is John John speaking in the throne room of God, and he says this, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Now, what does that tell us? A myriad is 10,000, okay? But usually in Scripture, um, and what most people believe it just means is, is a vast, uh, uh, just a vast amount a huge amount. So if you actually take 10,000, you can take that, and that's fine, Um, but you would be saying 10,000 of 10,000, thousands of thousands. What John is trying to tell us is, is in the throne room of God, circled around his throne, there was a number of angels that he could not even count. It was such a huge amount. So we don't know how many angels are around these shepherds right then, possibly a lot or possibly just a few, but either way, They are praising God in a multitude, giving him all the honor, all the glory, telling about the holiness of God that he is all due. I want you to look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, they start saying this, glory to God in the highest and on earth, 
peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now, this is the angel's doxology. Now, I want to say, I want to read you something real quick, and I'm sure to heck not going to sing it. But I'm going to read you something real quick, and you tell me, you, you guys, uh, after I get done, we'll take a poll of how many people know what I'm talking about. Angels we have heard on high, singing sweetly through the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Gloria in excelsis Deo, Gloria in excelsis Deo. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Now, if I would have sung that, probably all of you would have raised your hand, but I'm not going to do that. That's the song, Angels We Have Heard on High. Now, where do they get that song from? This passage. This passage. Whenever we sing at Christmas time and you hear all over the radio, Gloria in excelsis Deo, do you know what that means? That is the Latin phrase for this. It's the Latin phrase for glory to God in the highest. That's what these angels say. Glory to God in the highest. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now let's talk about that latter part real fast. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. This is not a working to guarantee your peace. This is not like I'm going to work up all these things and God is going to be pleased with me. Pastor John MacArthur, um, which I respect hugely. He is an amazing man of God, a faithful man of God. I praise God every time I get into his commentary and watch his sermons about how much he has been able to learn and just the knowledge that he has. It doesn't mean that we don't have any disagreements with uh, Pastor John, but he is an amazing scholar, pastor, and man of God. He says this when it comes to this, that the actual rendering for the phrase, peace among those with whom he is pleased in the Greek, is peace among men of his good pleasure. I'm going to say that one more time. Peace among men of his good pleasure. What is that telling us? Peace and salvation goes out to those that he is pleased through his sovereignty to give it to. That's what the text is telling us. And if you know my eschatology this morning, you know that I believe at the end of history that more people are going to be saved than lost. So I'm going to read this last portion in Luke to tie everything together. I'm not going to discuss it, but I want you to hear it. Here's where we're at so far. Here are these angels. They're visited by, I'm sorry, here are these shepherds. They're visited by this angel, and they're told, basically, what's going to happen. They're going to go into the city of Bethlehem. They're going to find this one that is the Savior. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is Lord over all. And then before they do this, this heavenly host appears and starts praising God. And we still praise God in the same way around Christmas time with the exact same wording, except for in Latin. And so here's what happens. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, that means quickly, and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. So what ends up happening is here are these guys, and they're the first to go and visit the Messiah, the Christ, the Lord, God, Yahweh in flesh. And Mary is just outstanding. She is amazed at everything that they are actually speaking to her, telling her about these angels and the praise of these angels and what had happened and who exactly these angels said that this baby boy was. Mary knew, but the reassurance is staggering. The reassurance is something that she would have probably loved to hear, and she treasured these things up. They spend some time with baby Jesus, and they head off doing exactly what they were doing before. It doesn't say they changed occupation, but you better believe that they were joyful. 
They were amazed. And God had blessed them with being able to go see the birth, the arrival of King Jesus. The one now that I believe these guys are godly men that they will call King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I think it's only right this morning for me to end off as we have been in the Christmas season with this passage um, during this time and stuff, really in the, the Christmas spirit is usually the only time we talk about it. But I want to talk really quick. We can't talk about Luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 7 or 1 through 20 without talking about one of my favorite sections of scripture, and that's Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7 prophesied hundreds of years before the arrival of the Messiah. This is going to paint everything perfectly for you guys. This is everything that has been told and now everything coming to completion of what has happened in, in, in this time, in their modern day um, Israel, in Bethlehem, around these shepherds. Whether they knew of Isaiah's prophecy or not, who knows? But this is quite powerful. I'm going to read it a little bit, and I'm going to stop and break down some of the words. Here's what Isaiah says. Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. For to us a child is born. A male child, a female child, we don't know yet. To us a son is given. There we go. It is a boy. It is a son. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now listen to this. This is amazing because Dakota did an excellent job with this last week. What's this government speaking of? This is the kingdom. This is the government that God has established through Christ Jesus, his kingdom, ruling and reigning forever. Now what I love about this is whose kingdom, this kingdom and this government, whose shoulder is it lying upon? Jesus's. It's on his shoulder. And it says that his name shall be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. This is Yahweh in flesh, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. As we just talked about peace, of what the angels start to praise God with. Verse 7, one of the most powerful passages in the Old Testament. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Did you hear it? Some of you are skeptical. Some of you are so skeptical that God's going to win the nations. What's the eschatology that goes out today? It's negative. It's all going downhill. I hear pastors uh, preach it all the time. It's all going downhill. What does Isaiah say? He says, here's the kingdom of God, the government, and whose shoulder is it resting on? It's resting on Jesus. He says there's going to be an increase. Is it going to say stagnant? Does it decrease? There's going to be an increase of his kingdom. The kingdom that when was it established? We talked about that at the very beginning of service. Established when Jesus says this, if the things I do by the finger of God, the power of God... If that is how I do it, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God came 2,000 years ago. He says there's going to be an increase of peace. It's continuing to go, just like that mustard seed in that tree. It doesn't get sprayed with weed killer and just stop. It goes. It grows. And Jesus continues at the end of the day, 1 Corinthians 15, he hands that kingdom over to his father. Then he destroys what? Death. He hands the kingdom because the kingdom is established. He says there will be no end. Dakota said something last week that we joked around a lot at the end of service, but it was quite powerful when he said it. I don't think he actually knew how powerful it was going to be. But if you think about it, it was very funny at the time that he said it. But after looking back and stuff, uh, once again, is extremely, extremely powerful. He said this, God is not a loser. God is not a loser. Now, why did he say that? Well, if you know Dakota, Dakota believes that God is actually going to fulfill what he says in Isaiah 9. What Jesus says, whenever he brings the kingdom, there's going to be an increase of peace. 
what the Old Testament says. He's actually subduing the nations. He's bringing all of them under his control, under his authority. The coastlands wait for his law. They are eager to get it. That is the day, that is the area that we are coming to when it comes to Christianity. That is not the area and view that people like to hold on to. They like to focus on the negative. The text says the exact opposite. The fall happened at the very beginning. Jesus comes. He's at the garden whenever this woman sees him. And what's the point of all that? Everything took place in the garden originally. Jesus is in the garden saying everything's back to be kick-started as new. I'm not bringing new things into this kingdom. What does the text tell us? I'm making all things new. That's you and I. That's this world. That's how Christ wins the kingdom. And he says, on the throne of David, over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it. Is he dropping the ball? Is he going to drop this world? Is he just going to let it go downhill and then come in and save the day through some military might and power? Is that what the text tells us? He says, no, it's an increase, and he's the one that upholds it. Why? Because we believe in a sovereign God, a God that's built off of providence, a God that already knows the end from the beginning, Isaiah 46.10. That's the God that we rely upon to uphold it with justice, God's law, and with righteousness from this time forth. What time? Well, the birth of this child, the Son of God. From that time, not here it is established and then let's dwindle off a thousand years and reestablish it. He says, no, from this time on, I'm establishing it, I'm upholding it, and it's going to increase. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. That's the most powerful thing in the whole thing. Who's going to do it? Kyle? (laughs) Any of you guys? No. No. Because we believe that God is a sovereign God, he says he's going to do it. The zeal of the Lord of hosts is going to accomplish all this. Why? Because Dakota said, the God that we serve isn't a loser. That's why I can look at you guys with the problems that you have and the problems that I have, knowing we all have problems, we all have sin, and I can say God will sanctify you if we will submit to him as Lord. He's working all these different things out. That's what I love about so much going to the abortion mill. Moms, dads come in. There are these heinous actions that they are wanting to take place. We give them the gospel. We talk to them for a few minutes. And what do you see? Old covenant to new covenant. Exactly what was prophesied in the Old Testament. The heart of stone becomes a heart of flesh. Now they're actually taking care of that child. Ten seconds ago before that, they wanted to become a murderer. That's what the gospel does. And it's only the gospel that ends up saving. What I love most about this is it's God's gospel. It's not my gospel. It's God's gospel. At the end of today and every single day, I can look at God's gospel. I can look at what he's doing, and I can know that he is ultimately on the throne. And praise God, I am privileged and blessed enough to be a part of this plan that he has set forth from the very foundation of this world. Guys, we need to get right with God. We need to be willing to praise God, but he has to be Lord over everything. Over everything. Do I struggle with that? You better believe it. And if you come to me and ask, you'll be surprised about some things you hear. We all struggle. We're all on the path of sanctification. And today, ultimately, we give God all the glory that he is due. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for the words that went out this morning. God, thank you for the amazing passages, God, that you give us in your word. God, with just such a heavy heart this morning, God, I just want to pray, God, for this congregation, for these people that are here today, God. I don't know their struggles, God. I don't know what they're going through. God, I don't even know if everyone even knows you. But God, I just pray that you open eyes, that you open ears, God. God, that you make their heart malleable and soft to receive the things that you have planted in their heart. 
God, I just want to thank you for these people, for the blessing that they are to me. I want to thank you for this corporate gathering, God, the time to worship. God, the time that we're able to talk about how sovereign you are, how good you are, Lord. And God, ultimately today, God, I just ask that you help me as a pastor of this small church, God, to be faithful. God, to repent whenever you call me to repent. And God, I just ask that for this entire congregation, that we would make you Lord in all areas of our life, never trying to claim neutrality, never trying to claim the ways of the world and walk that way, God. But God, during the time of communion that we're about to have in just a minute, that we will come before your throne. God, we will pray to you and we will get right before you this morning. God, that we will weigh that, God, and see if we have truly repented. God, to see if we are truly faithful, God. God, please don't let us just do it off of emotion. But God, to make sure that we are truly right. We love you, Lord. We praise you and we thank you. In your name, we continue to give all honor and glory because you are due all honor and glory. It's in Jesus' name, amen.